to thank everybody for coming out today for the Athens Town Hall meeting about the Georgia Power rate case currently before the Public Service Commission. And uh, without uh, further ado, I want to have us uh, give a special thanks to PSC Commissioner Tim Eccles for visiting with us today. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Brian, and he's going to give us a general synopsis of the rate case. All right, thanks, Don. Um, thank you, Commissioner Eccles, for being here tonight. Thank all of you for coming out on a beautiful fall evening. Um, this is great. What they're asking for in this rate case is an additional $2.2 billion over the next three years. Right now, they recover about $8.4 billion a year. So it's, it's a little bit less than 10%, about a 9% increase that they're asking for over that three-year period. Um, and the justifications that they've provided for those incremental costs are um, increased cost of their investments, the, the things in the rate base, so um, their investments in generation and transmission and distribution. That's pretty basic. Um, they're also looking for recovery of unrecovered storm damage costs. There have been several hurricanes that have impacted Georgia. Um, that totals a, about $449 million. Um, of the 2.2 billion rate increase. Um, they're looking to recover costs associated with managing coal ash, combustion coal residuals, coal ash. Um, that represents almost a billion dollars over the next three years. Um, and they're looking to um, recover updated depreciation and amortization expenses. So those are the main justifications that are provided in the rate case um, for the 2.2 billion incremental. <coughs> And in general, a rate case is pretty simple. If the commission deems the expenses to be reasonable and prudent, then the utility is entitled to recover them. All right. Uh, but what happens if there are uh, different perspectives, differences of opinion? And one of the things that we're picking up is that coal ash is one of those such subjects. All right. Some people think that the billion dollars is too much or shouldn't be borne by ratepayers and should instead be borne by the share owners of the company. There are other people who actually look at that billion dollars for the coal ash management and think that it's insufficient, that the program that the utility has put forward doesn't do enough to protect some of our waterways from some of the coal ash issues. So there's different perspectives there. These are the kinds of things that the commission has to wrestle with. Um, and then, once they've determined how much the utility can recover, there's an entire second step that is, who do they recover it from? How much do they get from the commercial and industrial customers? How much from the residential? Um, and how much gets embedded in the rate? And how much gets embedded in the other fixed charges? Because you know, technically, you don't just pay a rate. You pay a bill. And that bill is a combination of your consumption multiplied by a rate, and then added to that the mandatory fixed fee component. So here's where we have different perspectives again. Um, this proposal pretty significantly increases the fixed charge component of the bills. In some cases, it's double. Um, for the largest customer class, which is residential, it's about a 79.5% increase. So right now, the basic service charge for a residential customer is $10 a month. The company has proposed to instead charge $17.95 a month starting three years from now, with incremental steps over the next three years to get there. Is that a sufficient introduction? Very good. Yes. Does anyone have any questions before we kind of get this started? What percentage of the $2.2 billion will come out of the fixed cost? Do you know that? Um, it is in the filing, and I don't want to misspeak from memory, so uh, I'll, I'll find it maybe before we leave here tonight, otherwise... Uh, a, whole, a whole part? I, a quarter, a half, three quarters? I think it's 80% on the fixed and 20% on the fuel charge. I think it's 80-20. Is it 80-20? Okay. This demanding that a company go bankrupt because of extremely poor decision-making um, a reasonable option. Uh, they shouldn't have invested in more nuclear. They should have uh, 
since they're putting the CO2 in the atmosphere, they're responsible for some of the storm damage and the coal ash that are problem that they've known about since the beginning of time. I think that's a that, that's a good uh, question for your opportunity to come up and and share with everyone. Um, I, I will say just to point out though that. None of the costs in this rate case are associated with the expansion plant bubble, the two new units. Those are handled entirely separately. Um, so I, that's a good those, point to clarify. How are those uh, you know, dealt with, the plant bubble? Is that just increase in our rates? Yeah, well, right, yeah. right now, you'll see it. I know that, but just in terms of. You'll see it now as a line item. There's a, a nuclear construction cost recovery okay. line item on a, a rider on the bill. Um, once they are up and running, then they will come back in front of the commission to incorporate those into base rates. But right now they're not. There's a nuclear construction cost recovery line. Actually, Vogel Units 1 and 2 and Hatch Units 1 and 2, the existing nuclear reactors, are a part of the rate case because the operations and maintenance of those, those plants are a part of that. But the new reactors... Three As Brian said, three and four, that's a separate line item. To, to, to his comment on the bankruptcy, uh, as, as enjoyable as that might be for you, <laughs> it would void all the solar contracts that we have in our state, including all the power purchase agreements, and would probably put those solar developers in a very difficult situation because their higher priced contracts that they've had would be renegotiated now by a bankruptcy court and they would probably uh, probably not fare well. It would probably trigger a number of bankruptcies of various solar companies. So I'm not, I'm not sure that that would be the, the best wish for us. I don't wish bankruptcy on anybody. Uh, I, I think the power company realizes because of the pushback that 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 1795 is 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 too steep, uh, and I'm kind of giving away my opinion now. But um, you know, my prediction is they're not going to get that. Um, but I, I'm going to ask at the end of the night. I don't want to prejudice prejudice you now with it. But well, let's say in 2010 for the rate case, what if we had tied the base rate to 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 the rate of inflation and just said you know what, we're, we're going to let it go up each year just based on, you know, the, the cost of living index or inflation. And, and we, we, let's just automatically have that do that so that you're keeping up as we're going along as opposed to having these big chunks. Uh, and, and so I'll ask you at the end of the night what you think about that. I'm still thinking about it myself, but, um, but I, I wonder if something like that would be more reasonable, more logical, you know, for the average person. All right, so I guess we can just get started. If, you, if anybody wants to come up and give a comment, um, I think uh, I think I can kick us off. Uh, just to kind of, if, if you guys want to go ahead and make your way up to the, the podium. Um, Mr. My name is Don Moreland. <laughs> um, and so looking at the the increase of the base rate to 1795 from a solar perspective is um, it, it's a lot to take on. Um, uh, you may know, and I, you do know that you know at the Georgia Solar Energy Association, we are working with several MEAG cities and and other EMCs to try to uh, reduce what they call standby fees. And so these are additional fees that are levied on solar in addition to the base fee. Um, uh, but when you do increase that base fee in, in, in proportion, it does affect your solar investment, especially if it doesn't scale and, and if, if, there, if it's not an aggressive rate, then it will disproportionately affect those who get smaller sized systems and possibly knock those out because it's not any, no longer financially feasible. So. Um, uh, I'm not saying I have a, an answer for it, but uh, you know, just advocating from the Georgia Solar Energy Association point of view, it is a very large consideration and why we wanted to assemble this today. 
I lit into one of the witnesses that Georgia Power had brought in from San Francisco uh, because I felt like he was revealing that Georgia Power was was going after this cross subsidy uh, and that they were that that they were going to disproportionately impact solar customers. So I grilled this witness for about 30 minutes, you know, and finally got him to admit that he should grandfather in any existing solar customers. I was hoping that the attorneys representing the solar associations in the room would get up when it was their turn and give me some cover on this to basically say amen, to ask some further questions, and they did not. And I confronted the attorney in the lobby and said, why didn't you, why didn't you continue this line of questioning? And, and this, this is what this attorney told me. They said, our main concern is standby charges. And as long as they don't add those standby charges, we are willing to accept this. We don't want to raise a concern about this when we're much more concerned about this other thing. And so we are going to remain quiet on this issue. <laughs> and I said, I, I, wish, I, I wish you would have told me ahead of time, you know, before I embar embarrass myself there and making such a big deal about it, if it doesn't mean that much to the solar community. Mm -hmm. And since then, Don, I've had people run numbers on this to determine exactly what the impact would be on someone with uh, with a solar array on their roof, and because if it was just going up on the energy charge, I mean, just going up on the on the fixed charge and not the energy charge, it it would be uh, even worse. Uh, but because that energy charge is going up too, also that it's Mr. Moore, right? Uh, is it Mr. Moore? Mr. Moore has less than five points. He has a solar array. He is. And because he's now going to be avoiding a higher energy charge, his solar, his solar is technically going to be worth a little bit more. And I've actually had them run it on a 1,200 you know, kilowatt hour customer. So it, it, it's not as bad as I thought initially you know, that it was. And so I wanted to give you, and I had not told you this information about this attorney situation. Um, but I, I did feel like that, you know, I was out there by myself, you know, on this. I'm really sorry to hear that. Can I have that attorney's name and address, please? <laughs> In private, you can, yes. <laughs> All right. Oh, well, thank you for that. Uh, you know, grandfathering in is, uh, existing solar systems is a, is a great consideration. Um, I think you know by now that, you know, one attorney that might represent one association doesn't necessarily represent the entire solar community. So um, uh, that's what we're here for. Okay. We're ready for comments. Hi. My name is Mark Farmer. I live in Winterville, 30683. And um, I recognize that companies like Georgia Power have increasing costs and that these costs have to be met by those of us who consume their product in the form of electricity. So in the sense of, well, should we not have any rate hikes? Well, that would be an idealistic world and that would be great. But I'm, I'm a practical person. I recognize that that's not the reality. But what many of you who know me may not know about me is that I have a fairly strong libertarian streak when it comes to spending money. When I self-haul my trash out to the Athens Fort County landfill, I do my best to make sure that I've recycled as much as I can, composted as much as I can, and because I know that they're going to charge me more for four cans worth of trash than they will for two cans of trash. And the fewer times I can go out there, the less I have to pay. So I really feel very strongly in, in, from that perspective that we should pay for what we consume. And if we are paying for something that we are not consuming, then that strikes me as a very unfair situation. So if the rate hike has to increase, increasing the per kilowatt hour cost is, I think, the fairest way to deal with it in terms of, uh, as, as maybe you use a lot less electricity than I do because you've got solar panels on your house. Maybe someone else has a, installed a heat pump uh, at great cost to them to reduce their consumption. But it should be based on how much of a product that we use. When I go to the gas station, 
I don't pay $3 just to use their pump. I pay for the cost of the gasoline I'm buying. And with any other product that I, I purchase, it's based on my quantity consumed and quantity used, and I accept that I have to pay an appropriate price for that. But increasing the base rate for an individual really goes against my uh, personal feelings that, that we should pay for what we use and not pay for what we don't use. Excellent. Hi, uh, I'm Clint Moore, uh, 30606. And um, yeah, I'll, I'd like to balance out Mark's uh, comments with maybe some less well thought out comments, kind of maybe on the stupid side even. Um, but, uh, but actually, the very last thing he said uh, uh, you know, triggered something in me. Um, I, I ride my bike uh, pretty much all the time to get back and forth to work. And, 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 and I remember when I started. When I started writing, there was a lot of uh, you know controversy uh, some years ago in, in the Athens community about uh, uh, folks using bikes on the road, not paying their fair share, and, and you, you know even talk of a, like a flat tax or something that would be applied to, to bike riders because they're, they're they're not paying the fair share, which is ridiculous because I also drive and I pay you know fees on uh, on uh, you know, taxes on, on gasoline, so that you know I, I ultimately do pay for the roads, but. Um, but, but, it, but it strikes me as a, as, as a similar kind of thing. Um, before I came here, I had to, um, had to kind of bone up on what uh, like a regressive tax was. And, and like one, of, one of the examples listed uh, in, in the website I looked at was, uh, was the, the yeah, certain things like, like yeah, flat government fees. And, and, but, but also uh, uh, something that was interesting was the concept of uh, um, a sin tax, you know, where all you know the taxes on cigarettes and things like disproportionately affect, affect uh, s certain segments of the of the society. This strikes me almost as a as a virtue tax in a little bit, you know, it, 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 the, the the way that it hits, you know, um, and, and and it disincentivizes uh, a little bit, you know, in terms of what I can do with, uh, you know, my, my my overriding concern is to is to use uh, as as little. A great power as, as I can, really, regardless of the cost. But um, um, but you know, it, it, the the, the uh, fee this this large fee hike this large can certainly disincentivize that. I do like the idea of though a cost of living adjustment, and and this would be a, the rate they're proposing would be a ten percent per year cost of living. Uh, so uh, it feels something. Hi, I'm Michael Songster, and I live in the zip code 30606. Um, and though I'm not sure I fully believe that it's not going to harm solar users. I think that's probably highly situational. Um, individual to individual, there could be a difference. I do think it very definitely harms people who focus on efficiency, and we ought to be putting efficiency above all of those other concerns. And so I, I read in you know, online there was information, there was a calculator that showed that someone who only had about a $60 Georgia Power bill a month would see a 24% increase in their bill versus someone who was paying an average of $200 a month. And so those folks that are already, you know, cutting back on, on their usage are the ones that are going to get penalized the most by a base rate. And I think that's, that is, in fact, more damaging um, than the impact on solar, which I also think is a concern. Um, I, I guess I, I don't know nearly enough to really comment on this, but concerning the coal ash, it, it, it's, and I guess I can ask a question here, is the, is the coal that Georgia Power purchases part of your rate, or is that part of the investment recovery? And mm -hmm. this, Yeah, would you like for me to respond yes, yes. to that? So a fuel rider, there's uh, something called a fuel rider, and so we don't allow them to make a profit on the fuel. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a pass-through charge, if you will. And it, uh, it is like a revolving credit card account. So uh, it will uh, build up where they have spent more than we've allowed them to recover on it. And we just keep a running balance on it. And we will true it up from time to time. So the ash is not a part of the actual coal acquisition or the natural gas ac acquisition. So that's a, 
that's 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 a a separate rider, and they're not getting the ten point nine five percent. They're not they're not profiting off of that were, fuel. Is that money recovered for the purchase of the fuel through the rate? Or no, is it, it's through the base. It's price? through the rider. Okay, so it's a completely separate thing. Yes, on, it is. on our bill, and we yes. we pay for it. There's something on our bill that says. I think that there's a line item. Uh, a, a fuel recovery cost, fuel rider, something like that. Okay. Yeah, Brian, chime in here if you want. But uh, there's, I think, about four riders that are part of your electricity bill, and they all represent a certain percentage of the amount of kilowatt hours used. So the more kilowatt hours you use, um, everybody's paying the same percentage, but the more kilowatt hours you, you use, the higher... Uh, uh, rate of those riders you're, oh. you're going to be paying. Well, then it essentially is part of your rate and not part of your base. Charge. Indirectly. Yeah. yeah. Because it's, it's built the same way. Right. Yeah. 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 So the, the new feeder construction cost, you know, uh, cost recovery, that's an example of one of the riders that is tied to the amount of usage. But if the... If it, it seems that if we're paying for that as a proportion of our energy use, and, and that's the input into the plant, then this this cost, this output that they have, which is also essentially an accumulated incremental cost of the input, you know, that they have allowed to grow over time, that also seems like something. If they're going to recover it, then, then that should also come from you know the amount of energy that people are using, as so, opposed to being folded into the base rate. So let me see if I see if I understand this. You're you're thinking that your coal the the coal ash charge for the mitigation of the coal ash or remediation of the coal ash should be a form should be a formula based on historical consumption of your power bill or whatever consumption. I mean, I suppose if you do it in I mean, past it, time or real time, yeah, I, it, I it it actually makes sense because you 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 had a share of it going in and now you got a share of it. Going out, I, I haven't thought of it like that. So this, I think that's a good idea. Well, thank you. Um, Melissa Link, um, I live here in Athens in three to six oh one. Um, I would like to know how profitable Georgia Power is. Yes. How much are these shareholders? Getting a return on their investment. Investments are risky. When you buy stock, you don't know if that company's going to go up or down, um, and, and why aren't these shareholders being asked to shoulder some of the burden? And I also have some concerns about the plant mobile fee as well, but if you can answer that question right away. Yeah, I, I'm not a shareholder. I, I, I don't go to their corporate meetings. I don't listen in on their calls, so I don't know that much about that. I do know that, you know, that their shareholders had to eat almost a billion dollars worth of that nuclear nuclear plant costs that they wrote down uh, in the last year. So I know that they've taken some hit on that. I mean, it is a profitable company. It, utilities in general are attractive investments to people because they do get a high return on equity. Yeah. Well, I, I recall a number that was $2.3 billion, if I recall correctly, uh, Shareholder profits a year or two ago. I'm curious to know if their CEOs and top executives are getting higher and higher pay. Um, if you could ask those questions in some of these hearings, I, I think it's unfair that rate payers um, are shouldering some of these burdens. And you know, I've mixed feelings about the, the cleanup costs because um, folks who have settled in areas that are less likely to be impacted by climate change caused storms. Um, you know, or shouldn't necessarily have to bear all the burden of those costs. But then again, I have a mother-in-law who lived in a lives in a double-wide trailer in Colquitt, Georgia, who would live without power for over a month and had to climb over a tree to get in the door. Um, so, so I just I would like to see these costs distributed more equitably to the people who bear them. Um, and for those of us who have solar, I don't believe we should be paying into that plant mobile construction. Part of the reason I invested in solar is so that I will not have to contribute to the degradation of the climate, um, and which includes nuclear, you know, and, and the use of water and, and the mining of uranium and all these dangerous practices, um, not to mention 
what happens if something, God forbid, goes wrong. I, I really feel, feel that those of us who have invested in solar um, should be exempt from, from that new plant charge. I mean, every time I see that on my bill, I about throw up in my mouth. Um, so I would hope that you could bring those concerns to Georgia Power, that you know, we are looking to the future and, and investing in renewable energy so we don't have to pay billions and billions of dollars in nuclear plant boondoggles that could be the, you know, lead to the end of life as we know it, should something go wrong. Um, Melissa, if I could, if I could respond uh, to that, I mean, you, you do have the option to do what the Moors will eventually do, and that is probably go off the grid. If they've got solar, they've got batteries, and they're, they're you know, not too far away from being able to do that. You do have that option. You could cut that cord if you wanted to. Um, obviously, it's expensive, you know, it's expensive to do that. You know, the, the decision about how you generate power, you know, it is philosophical. It is, it speaks to, you know, a person's, even, even their worldview. You have a certain worldview that you, you know, explained tonight, you know, that, that you don't like nuclear energy, you would like to be exempt from it. Uh, and we don't allow people to opt out, you know, of certain energy uh, sources based on their personal preferences. It's, uh, you, you basically, if you're living in their territory, you've got, and you're going to connect to their grid, then you, you know, you take that grid the way it's delivered, and then every six years you've got an opportunity to kick those commissioners who regulate them out, right? We have, we're, we're one of only, we're one of only nine states that elect commissioners. All the rest of the states have the governor appoint them, and the disadvantage of that, of course, is that you get a puppet when you have the governor appoint that person. Here, at least, you have the opportunity to remove me if you are unhappy. You know, with my worldview, my philosophy, my responsiveness, you have a chance to say, you go home and do something else. We want this person in there. Uh, and, you know, that very well, you know, could happen, you know, to me one day. I view Plant Vogel and, and clean energy, I view clean energy, the clean energy future as solar plus batteries plus, plus nuclear energy because it's, it's, it's carbon free and it's allowing me to close coal plants. We just approved closure of another five coal units and without those nuclear reactors, we could not do that. Yeah, we've got the waste issue. Yeah, there's some other issues associated with it. I, I understand that. It is allowing us to close coal units. And so we'll never build another coal unit in Georgia. We'll continue to close those units. So I feel like that all the solar we just added, 2,260 megawatts, is going to move us into this next phase. We're going to we added 80 megawatts of batteries. We're going to experiment with batteries for the first time. And so, uh, and, I, and I anticipated 2023 when we do this again that we add even more batteries. So I feel like we're, we're moving forward. And yes, it's slow. It's not as fast as California. It's not as fast as Germany. Um, but it's Georgia. And it's, 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 it's the methodical way that we're doing things. And you have five Republicans that are sitting on the commission. And, 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 and we're doing it in a way that is true to our worldview and our, and our philosophy. And even though you might disagree with it, we're, we're trying to be true to what, you know, to what we believe is the, is the right way to go forward. Well, I have another concern about um, the impact of these base rate fees on our impoverished community. Um, like Mr. Farmer said, um, you know, it seems a lot more fair to, to increase the consumption costs, you know, per kilowatt cost, because you might have a, you know, a little old lady living on Social Security who uses very little electricity, but she gets that big face rate fee increase, and, and that really cuts into her income and her ability to feed herself. Um, let, let, me, let me respond to that. You, you're right. If you're a low... 
a low power user, 600 kilowatt hours or less, or you have a, a meter that's running something like your barn, uh, if you have a barn that's not using much power, that low user is going to be disproportionately income, uh, impacted. But I had them run the numbers for people that are getting lie heap assistance. That's what I wanted to see. Uh, uh, people that are struggling, that are having to get this additional assistance. Those lie heap customers are using about 1,200 kilowatt hours on the average. And they actually come out better with the formula way, the way that the power company has done it, that's with some, you know, with 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 the ten to the seventeen ninety five, and then that increase in energy charge. The heavier the user, the the better they are on the new rate. But you're exactly right. If you're a, if you're barely using any power, you're going to see a bigger increase. What about a tiered pricing? I mean, here in Athens, we do our water in, in a tiered pricing to encourage um, less consumption. Um, could we possibly do that? That would help encourage people to use less and make them more aware. And you know, certainly, what we see in Athens is, you know, folks who have the ability to pay are less of, you know, more likely to consume more because it's not a big deal to them. But, you know, other people are, are able to save significantly when they pay attention to their consumption. So what you're talking about is a price signal, right? Yeah. Um, Mark, why don't you explain the, the time of use rate you're on and how that sends you a price signal? So I'm on the, the EV rate, mm -hmm. you know, which means that between 11 o'clock and 7 a.m., uh, I run most of my power needs. I charge my car, I run my dishwasher, I run my dryer, and so that type of flexible rate plan does force behavior changes and I'm using now more electricity than I did five years ago and paying less for it. I mean, I, I kind of do the same thing, um, you know, knowing that I have solar panels working in the day and I try and run the dishwasher and the dryer and all that, that kind of stuff during the day. But not everybody has the luxury of being home during the day to do these things. I mean, if you're charging your car during the day, you know, even if people who can afford an electric vehicle, they're probably at work with that vehicle during the day. So, um, you know, that, I, I really would like to see some kind of consumption-based rate and, and possibly a, a tiered system. I'm noting that. Thank you. I, 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 think, I think tiered systems work in certain situations. I haven't thought about that. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Just a, a couple comments on that. There are uh, uses of tiered tiered rates and and your commercial plans. Um, it doesn't work like the water. It actually works like the inverse. So the uh, uh, the more energy you use, the cheaper yeah. it gets. That's, that's my which concern. is opposite of how the water typically works. You know, fast corporations and, and large scale facilities get a much cheaper rate. Yeah. And even with, you heard us mention standby fees before, and a, a lot of, not not Georgia Power, thankfully, because they're regulated, but some of these uh, unregulated utilities, they do have a tiered standby fee, depending on the size of the solar that, that you might install on the rooftop. So um, uh, it's, it's small, it, it's less of a fee for smaller, sized projects and if you could extrapolate that kind of reasoning to these base charges you know if you're a, a low user uh, you know to, to somebody's point before if you if you're not you know why pay for it if you're not using it kind of thing so if you're a lower in, uh, user then maybe it's appropriate to tier that base rate to, to reflect that all right yes sir yeah I'm, I'm Mac Duncan and uh, Three zero six zero five. Um, my first question has to do with uh, your graph showing the um, ten dollars um, that uh, we're currently charging, and then all the folks that were charging more. And we mentioned the x-axis, and I'm curious of the y-axis. How many people are charging less? And I don't need to know that, but it seems like it's sort of misleading not to. Are there people that are charging no, less? No, ten dollars is uh, okay. is the smallest. Uh, wow. That's awesome. Um, so I'm coming from a point of view that uh, my wife and I want to install solar. And one of the uh, things that's keeping us 
from it is the buyback rate that Georgia Power has. And then one of the things that I understand is, totally understand, is the infrastructure costs and the maintenance fees and everything. But it's my understanding that Georgia Power is not very transparent about how much those actually cost. I may be misinformed, but I'm just this. This is how I'm how I'm thinking. Um, but I'm concerned about the 2.8 cents kilowatt hour, whatever it is, that I might get paid for anything I overgenerate. Um, but my thinking is, if you go ahead and do this, that. Uh, <laughs> You need to pay more than 2.8 percent. If you're covering sort of your some of your infrastructure costs and some of your costs, then you need to pay more than 2.8 cents kilowatt hour to people that, because it seems like in general this is detrimental to encouraging the installation of solar power, and you could make it encouraging if. And, um, but I, I, let, let me just let me respond and say that you definitely should consult with someone like you know Montana uh, and a company or, or or Don's company. You should get advice before you spend that money and make sure that you're sizing it properly, that everything's kosher. Because we we just had too many people that have launched out and spent twenty or thirty thousand dollars, and they they could have done it a little bit differently and. And clearly, uh, you know, uh, there's a way to game the system. And you should talk to Mr. Farmer here uh, about gaming the system and figuring out how to maximize your investment. So that's, that's important for you to do that right. Pretty much been through that a couple of years ago and again recently, and I talked to all these folks. And this is still a little bit of a stumbling block. Because in the, in the summer, if I sized it, well... It seems like to me that Georgia Power could pay a little more, and that's all I'm saying. And if you're going to do this, you do need to pay more. And it's based on the avoided cost of energy. So if yes. if if our energy costs increase in Georgia, well, let's just say they let's just hypothetically hypothetically say your energy costs doubled, uh, then that that avoided cost would probably double as well or triple and you would get more. So the higher energy prices are, you know, the higher the avoided cost is. But there is a way for you to make money in solar and you just uh, you just need to talk to the, you know, and get multiple quotes and make sure you're on the right rate plan. Thank you. And also, thanks for what you're doing. <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to make a quick comment uh, based on on uh, this gentleman's comment. <laughs> um, and generally, when we look at utility rates and how they apply base rates and how much they compensate for the electricity that you export back, um, uh, when you have a utility that net meters, meaning that they pay back the amount that they charge you for the energy that you export back to them, then uh, it, it makes sense to, to, you know, maybe you make up for that with a higher base rate or something like that. If you're not net metering and you're only paying avoided cost, then um, it, it would make sense to, uh, to, to not have a higher base rate. Am I getting that right? I feel like I'm, I'm getting it mixed up. But when you have a utility that is is only paying you avoided cost and charging a high base rate, then that's kind of having your cake and eating it too. And that's what we're, you know, as policy advocates, we try to look out for that and, you know, and make sure, okay, if you're gonna do this over here, then there needs to be something more equitable on the other side and vice versa. So just to kind of follow up on your comment. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Carol Myers, uh, 30605. Um, I'm not going to say anything all that profound here, but um, I'm just, I guess, pushing for the kind of rate that has to do more with consumption than the increase in the base rate. Um, I work, I'm working with 100% Athens, and we have gotten uh, the resolution here in Athens and are committing ourselves to getting the county government to 100% renewables by 2035 and the rest of the community by 2050. 
Um, our group has a real emphasis on reaching 100% of Athens as well, including lower income households. Um, and, I, and I feel kind of, you know, if I, if we're, we're thinking of programs where we can help people with energy efficiency and such, uh, where we're going, oh, well, let's, let's work on this, but at the same rate, like you're going to cut down your, your rate here, but we're going to double the base rate. Um, and it seems like it would discourage lower income residents from following through on some of those programs if they're just going to get an increase in another way. Anyway, that's all. You know, I think there is a trend out there for more of a user fee society. So I, I think you're right. You think about tolls or a user fee. If you go to a state park, you pay a fee. And uh, if I don't go to the state park, I don't pay the fee. Uh, and, and so more and more, you know, companies, you know, services are moving to this user fee model. So I don't think it's unreasonable to ask for that. I mean, technically, we could take the base rate to zero yeah. and, and then raise the consumption another penny a kilowatt hour or two cent. And that really helps solar customers because now they're avoiding an even an even higher amount of, of consumption charge. And if, if and if we were just basing it on solar, and we've got about two thousand, you know, I guess two thousand rooftop arrays in Georgia power system. Does that sound about right? If we were just basing it on those two thousand customers instead of the other two point four million, mm -hmm. right? We would make everything perfect for the solar customer, and that's what the Georgia Solar, yeah. you know, organization is here for. They're here to advocate for their position, and that's exactly what they should be doing. And that inflation, that inflation charge, you know, the, I think I, I pulled up something on my phone and put ten dollars in for. 2010, and I think it raised it to like 12, so 1250 or so something. So it would be 1250 but, now? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, yeah. I'd have to go look at my phone, but it sure wasn't. And, and that means they would have been collecting a little bit along the yeah. way, and there would probably not be a need to, right. to raise it. So uh, then I hadn't run the math on yeah. it, but now that you say that, I'm even more convinced that's a better idea. <laughs> Hi, my name is Nikki Luke, and I live at 30606 is my zip code. Um, thank you for being here today. I don't have anything that profound to say either, but I just wanted to speak to the perspective of um, just someone who's a renter and a student and doesn't make a lot of money. I made a little over $20,000 last year, and as a graduate student at UGA, I moved here four years ago to pursue graduate studies. Um, I haven't gotten a raise in four years, and I don't get paid in the summer. So this summer in July, when it got really hot and our electric bill hit $240, that was a lot of money and unexpected. And so we did what we could to try and put that back and like turn our air conditioning up to 80. But um, I live in an old house, I rent, and I believe in the value of paying taxes. I'm a public employee and I know all the great things that and services that the state gives us. But as a renter, I don't see Georgia Power giving a lot to energy efficiency and giving a lot to people like me. And I really appreciate that you're thinking about LIHEAP customers, um, but LIHEAP money runs out, and there's a lot of people in this community that live just above the poverty line. So my wage, my salary doesn't put me below the poverty line in Athens, Clark County, and there's so many people living on that or just below that. And so what I, would, I just want to second what the person before me spoke said about um, thinking about a consumption-based model with maybe like a declining rate structure so that people using less power aren't paying as much. Um, and also speak to the fact that these fees, even when we're trying to do things to increase energy efficiency in our home, don't that wouldn't factor into that. Um, so I um, guess that's about it. And just really emphasizing that energy efficiency, I was excited to see Georgia Power uh, or see in that um, earlier in the summer when the pay as you save model was proposed, that that would do a lot for a lot of people in this community in terms of thinking about renters and, yeah. Just a word. Um, um, Brian, are you still in the room? Yeah. Um, did we, how much more did we add to the energy efficiency piece in the IRP? What was the percentage? 15%. So we added 15% more uh, against the companies, against Georgia Power's, you know, 
interest wishes, and they had let it be known that they didn't think it was a good idea, we did it anyway. What is IRP? Uh, uh, the Integrated Resource Plan. It was uh, passed in 1991 by the legislature. Uh, some, it's a mandate to the Public Service Commission to do uh, basically a 20-year strategic plan every, with a three-year update. Uh, so it's actually a great idea. It's never been amended. Uh, it was passed by a Democratic a democratically controlled uh, house, and it's never been amended. It's a, it's a good plan. To your point about renters, there's a lot of rental property here in Athens. It would be great if if there was a requirement to to have a score, an energy score, so that as you bought a house, and there is such a score available, it's called a HERS. Is it, it, what does that stand for? Home Energy uh, rating system. system. Uh, so there's a score that would tell you as a consumer how tight that house was and how, how energy efficient it was. It would be great for a, a, even a renter to know that. So that when you bought that house, you might know that, hey, something's wrong here. Let's look in the attic. Oh, there's no insulation here. That's why it has this bad score, and you would avoid that. That is That really is something that Athens Clark could take a stronger stand on. I mean, Athens has done some very creative things. Their their water their water system, even the, the workshop next door, signing people up to be able to be notified about leaks. The forty million Athens is spending on biking infrastructure, unprecedented. Nobody else in, in Georgia is spending that kind of money on biking infrastructure. So this community is not afraid to do bold things. It's just, you know, they, it's it just, you, ha, you do have, as a politician, you have limited bandwidth uh, that, w with what you can do. And so maybe they haven't been presented with this idea, maybe they have, but the next time you're with a city council or a commissioner uh, here, you might mention that, that it would be helpful to have houses scored based on their, their her score. And I know, I mean, my county commissioner has done a lot around thinking about what affordable housing looks like, and so any, it's like, property improvement means that it's probably going to be less affordable to renters who don't make enough to afford rent increases. So seeing things like ways that they could be incentivized to implement energy efficiency is important, I think. So thanks for working on that in the IRP. It is energy efficiency should be done before solar is put on the home. You need to tighten the envelope before you put the energy plant on top of your house. So clearly, I think you've got it in the right order. Thank you, Nikki. I'm Julie Duncan, 30605. Um, wanted to um, reiterate what uh, Michael Songster said very, very cogently that um, the lower income people will experience a higher percentage increase with this mandatory and um, the wonderful idea of making those who use more power in this 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 energy efficiency rate um, hike um, tiered system let's do that that's really important and it's work with water in Athens I think all the people in Athens are really conservation minded but um, and then also as a United States citizen, I wonder what other state um, co power companies are doing about paying for their coal ash fees. How do we compare with other states in the way that are those people in other states paying to um, control this, this substance that is deemed not toxic, it's very toxic. Um, and then, um, uh, the <laughs> We are the only state where the ratepayers are paying for the construction of a nuclear power plant, and I consider consider that just um, inexcusable. And it's our politicians who allow it to happen because I think if we had the citizens saying whether or not we would pay, whether or not the power company would pay for their nuclear power plant, or whether we would pay for it, I think. Um, as in other states, um, the citizens wouldn't be paying for A couple things, and you're right, Michael Songster did say put efficiency above all. So, whereas Michael, uh, 
Yeah, he's been on my radio show. Uh, so, yeah, you can go back and listen to the podcast. A uh, couple things, um, Julie. Um, you're, you, you all are, are right. These low users, as we said earlier, are going to be disproportionately affected, except under one, one circumstance. And that is if they're making their payment at Walmart. If customers are paying, do any of you pay at a remote location? Anybody? Pay your power bill not online or not through the mail? Anybody paying at Walmart? Uh, there's a $1.50 charge per payment, a convenience fee, and we're going to eliminate that. So the average person who is a prepaid customer, uh, they're paying about five times a month. So that would be $7.50. So they are, they're going to be the ones that are, that are least impacted. And obviously nobody is doing that in here. No one's ever made a remote payment ever at any location. Uh, but there are people that get paid on Friday that are struggling, that are behind, that when they go in, you know, to cash their check or whatever, they make a little payment on their power bill and they pay that dollar fifty. So that's going to be waived, uh, you know, going forward. Uh, as you know, to your comment about the coal ash on the other states, here, here's my thinking on that: is that, yeah, I wish we had known 50 years ago that we were going to have coal ash issues. That would have been nice. It might have determined what commi the commission did 50 years ago. Um, but, you know, there's, there's no way to go back. There's a lot of things that this culture did environmentally that it wouldn't do again, right? Even like the way that a landfill is handled, like the one I visited today in Barnesville, Georgia. Uh, so uh, we are more conscientious now. And is it, you know, here, here's what I ask myself on this coal ash thing. Is it, is it fair that this company... They were in compliance with the EPA all along. Now, because of new rules, they're going to be out of compliance. I hold the consumer's purse for, you know, as a duly elected, you know, regulator. And since they have to now comply and spend $5 billion over the next 15 years moving this ash to a safer location, either putting it in a line pond or a, a pond uh, that's, that's covered, you know, with an impermeable cap. Is it fair for me to now say, after they complied, you know what, we're just going to punish you and make you pay this $5 billion, you know, because you should have known better. I, I, just, I just have a problem, you know, in my conscience of saying to someone who had played by the rules that you now have to pay that you now have to pay for this, I just I just can't I just can't do it. Um, and so, as as much as I hate wasting five billion dollars because that's what it is, uh, we're going to have to comply because if if we don't, they they're going to be fined. And you know what? They're going to pass the fines along to us. So we, 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 we've, got to, we've got to do this, and, you know, and obviously it's in our best interest to, you know, to get this stuff moved and to, you know, we've got wells all around, you know, dozens of wells around these plants that we're testing every six months and, you know, checking to see, you know, I mean, with a third party who's, you know, who has chemists that are looking at this to see is this getting... Worse? Is it staying the same? Or is it getting better? We're obviously monitoring this. To answer my question, I, I really appreciate that. Um, to answer my question, do you know what other other companies are doing relative to having their, their, their you know, customers pay for the coal ash cost? I, I would imagine that those commissions are going to you know, allow or or make rate payers pay for it. Uh, that that is my guess. Uh, I mean, you may have a state like California, you know, who might might say, uh, you know, what we're, we're going we're going to punish you because there have been states that have had this kind of, you know, uh, attitude towards utilities. You've seen California do it with PG and E, which virtually bankrupted that company, and by the way, voided those solar PPAs, and so. Uh, it's it's not a good thing to bankrupt 
you know, bank, bankrupt a utility. Uh, but Georgia's not that kind of state. I don't think we're going to. I don't think we're going to go after the utility in that way. Hello. So I've got a, a, a few okay. questions first. Stick your name and sure. My name is Aaron Scranton. Um, actually, I live in Madison, Georgia, but I serve a lot of the folks in this room and uh, really everywhere in the state on the topic of solar energy generation and clean energy. Um, I tend to have a little bit different viewpoint than a lot of people, and I just like to educate people about those things. But for right now, one, one thing I'm really curious to know about is if the avoided cost is calculated on a 24-hour cycle. Or is no, it, I think it's... I think it's annual. I don't think okay. it's... Right. It, it's annual, but is it based off the value of a kilowatt hour any time during the day? Because a kilowatt hour at night is worth a whole lot less than a kilowatt hour during the day. And we only generate solar during the day. And so if we're paying for the avoided cost of a kilowatt hour based off of an average kilowatt hour's cost, when the nighttime kilowatt hours cost so much less, well, that's disproportionately skewing the average downward from the value of the kilowatt hour we're producing. There are times where real-time customers have kilowatt hour costs that spike well above 30 cents a kilowatt hour during summer afternoons. Solar customers are producing those kilowatt hours and at times not even using them. Uh, most of the time, at nighttime, kilowatt hours are worth about a penny to the utility company. That penny, 24 hour, or 365 days a year, is greatly skewing the average and decreasing the value for these solar customers who are really helping the grid a lot and helping the utility a lot. Well, th think, of, think about um, this. The, the two folks with solar arrays that we were talking about, um, um, Mark Farmer and then um, the, uh, the Moors here. So Mark Farmer's on a time of use rate and he is paying 20, 20 cent uh, from two to seven. So any kilowatt he avoids from two to seven, right. he's, he's actually paying himself 20 cents. So that's why I say he's beating the system. Um, where you guys are paying about 11, so you're avoiding, you know, you're avoiding 11 cents. So there's a nine cent difference between what he's making and what you're making. Um, and so that's why I recommend that you go on time of use rate. Uh, as quick as possible, like, you know, call them tonight, you know, <laughs> and go on it. So, and, and to address your point, because I consult people about this every day, anytime I have the ability to move somebody to a time of use rate when it really makes sense for them with solar generation, oh, it's definitely a recommendation because with a small percentage of your consumption, you can avoid a much larger percentage of your bill. It's the best way to get an actually attractive payback in this state. It's really the only way. And I'm no fool. I mean, I talk to people at least four or five people a day that I literally call on the phone and talk to about this in George Power. So I know exactly where you're coming from, but I also know how much value that really has to the utility company versus that nighttime electricity. And, and despite what you're saying, because I agree, and I'm gonna keep pushing people towards those rates, and those fact those rates exist make our company able to exist in a large way too, but it's still not fair in terms of the avoided cost. It seems like, yes, that's right, that's beautiful, but it's not addressing the actual question. Why is avoided cost calculating nighttime expense? Um, can I ask you a question about being on a time of use rate plan Absolutely. and generating more than you're using? So you're actually exporting energy, you're on a time of use rate plan and you're exporting energy at the, at the, the peak time. Um, what from two to seven, or whatever the case may be. How much is that kilowatt hour worth that you're exporting? Right. Uh, well, the rate would say it's twenty cents, but once you total everything in, it's more like twenty-four cents a kilowatt hour, or something along those lines. I don't know. All the percentage so, modifiers affected. So, do you get reimbursed um, twenty-four cents when you export energy during? Absolutely the peak not. Time? You, get, you get reimbursed your three cents a kilowatt hour because that's flat. Now, if you're on Sony EMC, you'll certainly get reimbursed your time of use rate for your export. Yeah, they're on a net, net billing. Plan. Net billing, and the net billing does include time of use. The company over there recognizes, well, I just pushed a button. 
<laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but that company over there, and Georgia Power has the same capability. They, they recognize the value of a kilowatt hour during their peak times. They have a little bit larger peak time, but at the same time, they recognize the value. And if they export a kilowatt hour during peak, they're going to get the full retail value of that kilowatt hour. Well, I, I might also add, in addition to the time you're generating and exporting that energy, also the location. Yes. should be factored in because I think a kilowatt hour uh, generated on the roof of this building during the day is worth more than one out you know in the middle of, of oh, yeah. you know uh, South Georgia somewhere that's away from a load center because that electricity has to travel over long distance transmission and just distribution lines Absolutely. to get to its destination luckily out of the IRP the integrated resource plan that we had earlier this year, what, one thing that came out of that is a review of avoided cost, and uh, it'll be after the rate case uh, um, in the beginning of next year, maybe January or February, where the PSC will be undergoing a review of avoided cost, and a lot of this will be hashed out. Now, what you speak of is really the true value of solar, right? And and we certainly and I. And, and, and really for about five years, this locational pricing, this locational adjustment, based on putting solar in a very congested area, would make it more valuable, should make it more valuable to the company. If they're not having to build that substation or up, upgrade that transformer, right, that solar helped them. Yep. And, you know, as a, you know, as, as a, Politician, you have you have a certain amount of capital. You have you have a you, you have you have a limited amount of political capital, and and I I spend all of mine. I spend it all, and I've 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 worked on this issue, but I haven't had enough in the bank sure. to be able to make this change, and I haven't been able to convince my colleagues. I've pestered people. I pestered. Keep it up. That's not. That's not necessarily effective. Pestering is not necessarily effective. Um, but I'm. St I, I hear you. You're right. But I, I. I haven't been able to get that done, and I'm sorry. I, I haven't been. Able, but I'm not done yet. Oh, I appreciate it. And this guy's, this guy's helping me. He helps me a lot. I understand. It's not like you're the only guy running the public service commission. You're one of the commissioners. I understand that. I appreciate your assistance on the issue. Um, one of the other things that we're here to talk about is the flat rate. And I, I just got to side with everybody that I, I'm concerned about the most vulnerable population in it, realistically. I mean, solar or not, I don't care. It seems like the most vulnerable people would be the most affected by this flat rate. And I, that bugs me. You know, I think it bugs anybody with a heart that the most you know, the least of us get hit with a burden beyond which we can bear. Um, the only question I have about that is, you know, people with money can get solar, people with money can make efficiency improvements, people without money can't even make the efficiency improvements. And so, have you done any kind of study looking at how much does this hurt people in Section 8 homes that don't have the, even the efficiency improvements? and how that balances out. I, I have not. The only comparison I had them make was LIHEAP customers um, versus super heavy used customers that sure. use 2,000 sure. kilowatt hours or more, and then that all the way down to the 600. Sure. You know, 600. Yeah. Uh, and when I saw the figure on the LIHEAP, I did breathe a little bit easier, um, but yeah, we, I, haven't, I haven't drilled down you know, to find out you know, uh, more about those folks that are only using 600 kilowatts, kil kilowatt hours. That's a very small amount of power. Oh, and it is. So that's a person probably that's not using air conditioned, you know, that may have just a one one bedroom, you know, house. Um, so, uh, yeah, I will. There's an amazing I, number of people in this town that have more than one bedroom and use that much energy. I do have to say that. I look at these people's power bills all the time. They do an amazing <laughs> job of conserving energy. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm hearing a theme here, though, and I heard it in Savannah last night, and that is don't let that base rate jump that high. Yeah. Is, that, is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah. 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 So, um, and, and 
And I think that that goes across the yeah. scale. Yeah, and, and, and I, I will fight for that. I'll give you I'll give you my word that I will fight for that. Um, one last thing I'd, I'd like to just make as a final comment is uh, distributed generation obviously is overlooked as a part of grid resilience. Um, that's something that a lot of people never really think about when they talk about solar and battery storage, um, besides the obvious equity, independence, and other factors uh, that, that you could mention. Grid resilience is a huge thing, and, and building a microgrid is a massively important thing as we move into an uncertain future. I have family and military intelligence and cybersecurity, and nuclear is clean when Russia and China don't get in and push your buttons. And, I'm not here to be a fear monger, but those countries have managed to get into other countries' grids before. And we've got a lot of nuclear power on the eastern seaboard, a lot. And we're just building more in Georgia. Yeah, these things are clean until you're Fukushima, until you're Chernobyl, or until China or Russia decide it's game on. And that bothers me a lot. Not only that, but if you do studies on how a population fares when the grid goes down, it's frightening. And so anything we can do to build more resilience in our population is a necessity. Yeah, I hear you, and we approved 80 megawatts of batteries, and if these batteries go well, I, I anticipate us doing 10 or 20 times I love that. more I love that. Uh, in three yeah. years. So we'll, we'll see how they go. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Sorry, can I just interrupt here? I, I just want to pass this around before people leave because the uh, the, uh, the Partnership for Southern Equity is helping sponsor a van or a bus to go to Atlanta on November 5th to speak at the Public Service Commission meeting. Right. So I just want to get on the fourth. No, we're on November 4th. Is that yeah. November 4th? Good. That was good to there. Anyway, I'll pass this around while people are still here. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go for um, maybe these last two folks that are waiting will be our, our last two commenters. Um, and then we'll wrap things up. So um, please, yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Eccles. Uh, my name is Craig Topple, um, 30606. Please send my regards to your colleague, uh, Commissioner McDonald. I pastored his, the church he grew up in for uh, a few years. So it's Commerce Presbyterian? Yes, sir. That's right. Um, uh, to answer a question that was brought up earlier about um, I think somebody mentioned about CEO pay. Um, CEO of Southern Company is set to make about $13 million, I think, per, per year. And uh, he just bought a $5.3 million home property in Atlanta, it looks like. Um, and it looks like Southern Company's stock has done pretty well. I'm wondering when this was announced, uh, because it looks like just this fiscal, just the year to date, the stock's up about 80%. Um, so I was curious, you know, Investors are future forward looking. When was this proposed to have this? And was this a rollout across Southern Company entities? Or is this just, just something that Georgia, Georgia Power is doing? Well, are you referring to the proposed increase in rates? Right, yeah. It, is Southern Company you know, wanting that across the board with all their we don't, different power? Uh, we don't regulate Southern Company, right. uh, so we only regulate that one unit. So right. Alabama right. Power does right. their own yeah. rate cases, Mississippi does their own yeah. rate cases. So is when was it proposed by Georgia Power? I'm sorry? When was this proposed by Georgia Power? The, our, our rate case? Right, yes. Yeah, so it's due every three years. Uh, it's, it's the calendar we have them on. So it was submitted earlier. We had just the first set of hearings two weeks ago. Okay. We'll have another set of hearings on November 4th uh -huh. for that week, and then we'll vote December the 4th. Okay. The new rates would take effect January 1st. Okay. I was just wondering if it was... Maybe they had just made a decision about making these increases, and that's what led to such a. I think it was actually filed stock, on stock October third. Yeah. You know, the, the the compact, you know, the, this regulatory compact that the original rate case was filed. Was it September or? It, it could have been something that was proposed within the interim of the company. It's right before the IRP. Uh, okay. Well, so it was okay. June. But uh, yeah, thank you again for your service and for your work to, for the for the average citizens and, and our needs here. And, uh, um, thank you for promoting solar, too. I really appreciate you setting an example for that. As the rest of us attempt to do that in our own lives, yeah, it's, it's helpful to have people like you doing that. So thank you. Thank you for your comments. All right, we've got about five more minutes, so we're, let's try to, we'll try to get through these quickly. Oh, 
Hello, I'm Gail Gill, and my zip code is 30622. And my question is, um, there's a lot of comments about how the uh, rate increase was 80% of the costs were reflected in the base, and so that means only 20% are in the general Can you give us um, a reasoning behind that, and, to, and why wouldn't it be the other way around, perhaps like 20%? on the base and 80% on the variable rate because, as everyone said, it, it seems to be regressive and hurts the lower income people the most. Yeah, I, I don't work for Georgia Power, but I'll okay. tell you what they told me. Okay. All right. So they said that because they haven't raised this in, you know, in many years, that the fixed cost to service a customer, uh, whether that be the billing piece of it or uh, the meter, uh, or in any of the fixed costs that they have hasn't kept up with the times and that they are, quote, wanting to modernize the rate uh, and and have it be more accurate, right? That, that you can't really do anything for $10 uh, and certainly not service, you know, the fixed cost of an electric customer. That's the, the case that they made. Uh, so I, I don't know that... Yeah, I don't know that they're going to get this, okay. uh, but I their rates kind of will go up because we are. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry to to, okay. to to cut in because we are obligated to provide them the resources that they need to run that company. Uh, it's just a matter of how are we going to divide divide that out? How who's going to pay what share of that in industry versus? Restaurants versus commercial customers versus retail versus consumers. You get the idea. Well, I was just trying to understand the reason why that split seems so awkward or you know, lopsided, and you've expressed what that is. And as you've said, um, it seems like such a big jump on the base, and maybe they're not going to do that. And then again, I'd like to thank you for your efforts on solar. So much. Thank you. It. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Mary Beth Tolfin, 30606. Uh, I moved here nine years ago, and we were told there were AMCs and all this kind of stuff. And where I live, I don't have a choice. I can only have Georgia Power, or I guess my choice is I can have no power. Yeah. Um, or you could move. Well, so we bought a house and have invested a lot in buying energy efficient appliances, a new roof, uh, replacing a 24 year old. HVAC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, the difference between paying, you, you were talking about investments. You're saying Georgia Power says they need to make investments. And you, you, your example was 30 acres on the Chattahoochee River or something to that. 7,000, but okay. it's close. <laughs> so, you know, if, if I'm a member of the Walton EMC, and they make an investment and they buy 300,000 acres of land and then they decide later to sell it, I get some of that money back. But if Georgia Power does, if they say they decide to sell the coal, the, the area where the coal plant is, they, then they let's pretend they make money on it. I don't think I see any back. I don't think they yeah, you're, me you're, you're getting You're getting money back all the time. You just don't know it. It's, it's not put, up, put on your bill on a line item. But... The fly ash that they sell into the concrete business, half the ash, the new ash coming out of the coal plants, going right into the con concrete, being put into inert structures like your highway, like a skyscraper, bridges, so and you're getting you're getting the money for that, and that's put against what we, you know, our ratepayers owe them. So yes, you're getting 100% of that uh, as a credit back against. It's a, it's a hidden. Uh, it's, well, we can't. It's not, it's not yeah, we it's not we can't do a line check. item for everything, gotcha. right? Gotcha. So, um, so the other thing that I would just like to say is, um, your thing about coal ash when you were saying, well, we didn't know, and so now, um, now we have to comply with new regulations, so we have to pay for it, and I, I think that's very true. Uh, except I don't think they didn't know. Um, people have been dying from working from breathing coal ash for 300 years. And so what really worries me about the nuclear ones is that nobody's talking about Fukushima. One person has mentioned it. 
And if a solar plant explodes, people don't have to move away for 300 years. And I don't think that they're being, you know, the company that was building that actually went out of business. They declared bankruptcy. And, and um, I think that not having a choice makes me feel very frustrated because I know that Walton is heavily uh, invested in solar and that sort of thing. And I don't know what it is about it, but just having to pay for it and having it put into things like base rate when my power bill is automatically billed, it's automatically collected, there's not a human hand that touches that. Why are they charging me more for that? I don't understand that kind of thing. And so I really wish that, that they would make the fees more transparent as to what we're actually paying for. Sure. Because just like you said, using that, that leftover ash and that kind of stuff in industrial applications does make me feel a little better about it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, our last commenter. And then we'll wrap things up. Yes. Hi, I'll be quick. I'm uh, Gabriella Pinstein. I'm a graduate student at UGA and a renter in zip code 30606. Um, I'd, I'd like to echo a lot of the concerns expressed um, tonight about the effect of the mandatory fee on uh, the increase on low income folks, um, recognizing that the county I live in has among the highest poverty rates in all of Georgia, not the highest. Um, my graduate teaching assistantship provides me with about $14,000 annually, so um, yeah, just echoing the fact that the mandatory fee increase um, unfairly burdens low-income folks. And I'm also concerned about the fact that um, lower-income folks are required to bear so much of the burden of the coal ash cleanup um, for the toxins released in their communities and their water by Georgia Power. I don't see it as just about EPA compliance because the EPA has effectively been allowing this pollution to take place. Um, and while I absolutely agree these sites urgently need to be cleaned up, there's no question about that. I'm just wondering why shareholders aren't expected to pay more um, to remove toxins from these communities. And I'm wondering why um, these costs are shifted to ratepayers who have also who have done nothing wrong. Um, but I've been experiencing this pollution through the mandatory fee that seems to unfairly burden low-income customers. So I just wanted to express those concerns here. And thank you. I appreciate um, you coming to this town hall and participating. Thank you. Thank you, Gabrielle. And thank you, everybody, for, for coming. I want to also thank our hosts that helped put this together. There's a lot of a lot of work behind the scenes that goes into stuff like this, so um, I want to thank everybody. But more than that, um, I think uh, uh, you would all join me in thanking Commissioner Tim Evans for joining us today. He's been the hardest working PSC commissioner out there, and I've said that publicly in front of some of the other ones that gotten some slack for you. But, um, I mean, the, the, he was in Savannah yesterday but talking about this, and here today, and um, he, he's very accessible. So if you did not get a chance to ask him a question or comment, he, um, I believe you have some cards, and um, I think you will find that he will be very responsive to your questions, and um, uh, uh, he, he's, uh, he's one of the good ones. So thanks a lot, everybody, and thank you, Mr. Evans. Thank you all. Good night.